Well, last time we were together, I was extending uh, Thanksgiving greetings, and now I'm extending Christmas greetings. This is my last time to speak this year, but Mark has graciously invited me to come back again, so we will continue to launch through the book of Proverbs together, Lord willing, in 2021. Uh, This morning... We have four Proverbs, very difficult, uh, particularly uh, verse 19. It's chapter 18, 16 through 19. And if you're an attorney, uh, have a legal mind, these uh, Proverbs particularly would, uh, would be resourceful for you. Okay, uh, chapter 18, beginning in verse 16. A person's gift makes room for him and leads him before great people. That's an interpretive question there. I thought it would be rather straightforward, but it's not. 17, Uh, And really, the way you take and understand verse 16 has a direct effect on verse 17. In 17, the the first to present his case and his dispute seems right until his opponent comes and cross-examines him. Here's 18. The lot puts an end to conflict and separates powerful opponents. And finally, 19, an offended brother is like a strong city, and conflicts are like a bolt. You probably have barred gates, bars, uh, are like a bolt of a citadel. I'll explain bolt to you if you're not familiar with it. Uh, Here's the way I'm going to teach these four Proverbs. Here's what I believe that the Lord would have you to learn and the way that I think of them. Uh, The first is uh, verse 16. The gift accomplishes God's plan and purpose. The gift accomplishes God's plan and purpose. 17. Real wisdom listens to both sides. Real wisdom listens to both sides. Here is 18. A lot, uh, the Lord's guidance leads to discovery and peace. The Lord's guidance leads, leads to discovery and peace. And finally, 19, wisdom treats all people with great care. Wisdom treats all people with great care. Here's the exposition this morning. This opening line, verse 16, a person's gift, that is a common ordinary individual in contrast to the sovereign Lord who bestows the gift. You see, the Lord is the silent and invisible one in the proverb. We think theologically about these proverbs. And we think in terms of everything originating with the Lord Himself. Now, here's what makes the proverb difficult. The word gift. It's rather generic. It could be a material benefit, and it's used that way in Genesis 34.12 by Shechem to Jacob. Uh, Or it could be taken as a personal talent. Uh, If we took it as a material gift that would gain access and unjust advantage, then verse 17, our second proverb, would add to that discovery. We know what that idea is. It's called pay to play. Your money 
Your gift, whatever it is, gains you undue access before great people. I don't believe that that's what the word gift means in this particular proverb. And I'm going to try to demonstrate that to you by using the Reformation principle of interpretation, comparing Scripture with Scripture. And that's the way that we interpret by saying that the Spirit of God spoke over here, the Spirit of God spoke over here, so are now our, pe- our question in this passage or our word in this passage, our phrase in this passage, will be aided because the Spirit of God doesn't contradict Himself. If you see a contradiction in the Word, believe me, it's between your own ears. It's not between the Spirit. So it's up to us to work it out. And that's what I attempt to do here with this word gift. So I believe that the word gift is God's providential blessing and He gives it indiscriminately to all people. Not to believers, but to unbelievers as well. Here's my example. E equals MC squared. God gave Einstein that knowledge and it opened up all kinds of doors for our world. Nuclear fission. Uh, I believe that there is a genius to sports, motor skills. And here's simply the way I would illustrate that to you. If I have a million dollar prize to uh, win a basketball game, uh, do I want to pick Albert Einstein on my team or do I want Michael Jordan? You see, there's a, a genius to ability and we we pay a lot of money for that to see people perform i was engaged a long time ago with a a very serious tennis player and uh, i don't know a whole lot about tennis i watched and i understand some of it and he said no you you don't understand roger federer he makes shots that I've never seen before. I don't think anyone's ever seen before. Well, see, that's genius. And, uh, and so we go back to Dan Duncan's uh, great phrase, God makes men smart to do smart things. And it's not just for believers. It's for unbelievers. But the key is it's accomplishing God's will and purpose. Uh, here's the illustration, Genesis 4. Cain. Now the curse of God was upon him. He was a restless wonder in the earth, but what did he do? He built cities. And technology expanded as a result of him in the world. Arts, music, all came from him as a whirling. So it's just a generic gift, and that's the way I understand it. Now, here is my interpretation of it to support that, that it is God's plan and purpose to guide and to lead, and that's why He gives them. Genesis 26, it's used for the blessing of God as He moved out Isaac from the hostilities at Gerar. Genesis 26, 22, He says, Now the Lord, notice He says the Lord, who is He attributing things to? the God of providence. Now the Lord, and here is our words, right here from our proverb, made room for us, He says. Now, that that is, uh, He's attributing the providence of God, the sovereignty of God, to His experience. Someone in Isaac's camp had the amazing ability to find water. I, I doubt that it was Isaac himself because at the end of that chapter, he's just sitting in his tent twiddling his thumbs. And they come in and said, we found water again. So, we've all benefited from being around 
being in a group, a team, that has very gifted people for gifted things. God makes men smart to do smart things. Now, here is line two. Uh, Talent, gift from above. Look at these words, leads him. Those words are used by David in Psalm 23. Leading, guiding David, the great shepherd leads him and guides him. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He leads me, he guides me through life. That's these very words. And finally, this in phrase, line two, before good, great people. God's talents give one an audience. That's just the way it is. That's reality. But let's think of it biblically, theologically. Let's think of it in terms of the fear of the Lord and righteousness. Uh, Pharaoh says to Joseph, Genesis 40, verse 8, I hear it said that when you hear a dream, you can interpret it. Now, what does Joseph say? Yeah, I'm your guy. Of course, yes. Why? Why, knocking down a project like that? That's nothing for me. But he didn't say that, does he? What does he say? He says, don't all interpretations come from God? See, he knew where the gift came from. How about Moses standing before Pharaoh? Think of that intimidating situation. And there he is with that shepherd's staff. But it wasn't the shepherd's staff, was it? It became the rod of God. And used in the direction and purpose of God, throw it down. Watch what I do with it. Stretch it upon across a sea and watch what happens. Stretch it upon the sky and look what happens. How about this one? 1 Samuel 17, 37. It's little David sitting there, or really standing there, probably at attention, uh, in the tent of Saul. And he says, I'm going to go out and fight this giant. And uh, Saul says, well, you're just a little young boy. And what does he say? 1 Samuel 17, 37. The Lord! The Lord! Uh, Just like uh, Joseph. Just like these great men. Uh, Isaac, the Lord. The Lord who delivered me from the paw of the bear, the paw of the lion. Well, He'll take care of this antagonist out here. You see, gift, talent, And David knew that. Uh, Psalm 144.1, Blessed be the Lord my God who trained my hands for war, my fingers for battle. He was a great athlete. He had great dexterity, skill. That's why he was who he was and how God made him because God used him to lead and guide and shepherd His people Israel. So, we end the proverb by asking the same thing that we asked last time, 1 Corinthians 4, 7. What have you that you have not received? You see, if you take that talent and use it all for yourself and absorbed with it, it'll destroy you. It'll ruin you. And we see it every day, don't we? Yeah. But when you you use it for the Lord's purpose, For Him and for His kingdom, there's great blessing and there's great advancement for you and me to do that. Here's 17. The first to present his case and a dispute seems right. Okay, so if one interprets verse 16 as a pay-to-play, self-serving gift that allows one an opportunity to present his case unopposed, Well, then this proverb speaks particularly against that. But that's not my view. Uh, 
And I leave that to your consideration for your own study. Uh, I believe that this is a proverb against making hasty judgments. Appearances can mislead. So one needs critical questions as to another's testimony. Seems right. Everything seems to hang together. But there's always another side. I'll never forget in the late 70s, I heard this lady say in a conversation, my husband took me to the most marvelous movie the other night, entitled Breaker Morant. Harry Harbour Morant. A true story by Kenneth Ross. A movie about a military trial, Morant, uh, in a court-martial, 1902, and several of his men. It won a slew of awards, so well done. I recommend it to your viewing pleasure. Uh, and every time I come to this proverb, here, verse 17, I always think of that movie. There's always two sides to everything. And that's the point. Hasty judgments is not wise. Appearances can mislead. And critical questions need to always be inserted. Line 1 opens. The first, it's a reference to the first litigant. The first to give his testimony. These opening words, case. Word means dispute. The possessor has a dispute against another. Now line two, look at this, until, that is a very important, strong contrast of temporal sequence, here, 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 sequence, in the inspired language. You could translate it, but comes, it's very strong. And so here is a new circumstance, a new providence. The word opponent is really the word neighbor that we find all the time in Proverbs. He's the third party. He's the ordinary citizen. He's just walking down the street. And this word comes. You see that? Clearly the idea of stepping forward with a contrary position. The word examines means to probe. David used it in Psalm 139, verse 1. He said, you have searched me. That's our word. Probed me. Examined me. Solomon uses it himself in Ecclesiastes chapter 12, in verse 9. Speaking of himself as the wise man. He says, the wise man, he searched out, sought out, examined many proverbs. He probed them. That's our word right here. So it is an examination, a testing, something hidden, something hard to find, use of mining of precious minerals in the earth. Job 28, verse 3. You don't find diamonds on the ground. You have to dig around for them. A true and compelling testimony should hang together, be consistent as to facts and details. And so the proverb teaches us we should always have a good and thorough evaluation of both sides of a testimony. Can it stand the searching? Can it stand the probing? The attack, if you will, of an opponent as to the validity of one's statements. The truth is what we all seek. No matter who or what is affected, we want the truth. Finally, let me just say, regarding this proverb, my mind often runs to the Lord Himself. Because I think this proverb magnifies our Lord Jesus Christ. How often throughout the Gospels did the spiritual leaders, the scholars of the day, come to examine Him, probe Him? They were looking for inconsistencies. Oh, we've got him now. We've got him. If he says this, we'll say that. He's got no place to go. 
And what happens? He leaves them always in tatters. The scholars of their day, often left in direct silence, they just merely walk away, defeated again. Here's 18. And so in 17, we had the seeking of fairness of judicial procedure in ancient Israel. The prescription for wisdom is to hear both sides of a testimony. But look at this proverb. There is a limit to what judicial procedures can actually bring about. Here, we're addressing a practical matter, the lot. A group of stones considered a wise way to reveal God's selection of several possibilities. Remember now, and people don't stop and consider this, but when this proverb was written, you don't have the Scriptures in everybody's hand. Now, there was no way we could all turn to Romans or Philippians or, or the book of Kings. What does this say about that? There are very few scrolls of the law. So, understand this was necessary for practical guidance in life at the time. We don't throw dice anymore. We don't throw these rocks anymore. We have the Word of God. And that's what we diligently study. So this isn't like Las Vegas dice. These are godly people trusting the God of providence to resolve conflicts among the powerful. If a guilty party could not be identified among the wise, then they pulled out the lot and they used it to isolate the offender. And Dan just gave us that from the book of Joshua with Achan recently. This word conflict, here we've seen before, it would represent a legal dispute between two parties. Thus, the use of the lot would end the two parties' separation. Now, let me give you this word separation because these words are magnificent. I'm going to give it to you. You'll never forget it. It's used in 2 Kings 2.11. And here is the context of that passage. Elijah and Elisha are walking together. And the Scriptures say, talking together. Suddenly, and behold, says the Word of God, a chariot of fire and horses of fire appeared. And here comes our word from our proverb. Divides. It divides. It separates the two of them. And Elijah went up to heaven in a whirlwind. That's divided, separated. One went to heaven, one remained on the earth. Now, if your translation has the word between, just realize that's been inserted. That's not necessary for the text at all. The text just really says divide, and that tells us the whole story. Look at the proverb. It ends with these words, powerful, powerful. The adjective, powerful, it could be a reference to physical prowess. The word is used that way in many contexts. But here we understand the immediate context is probably a person of considerable wealth, influence, power. Here's the point. God judges us in divine providence. He judges, and be sure of this, no man ever gets away with anything. You see, that's the announcement of the wicked man, Psalm 10. He doesn't see. He doesn't know. I'll do what I want. But he does see. Because he's very much alive. Just not alive in your own mind, wicked man. No, he does see. Here is something I think you'll find interesting. Two places in the Old Testament this phrase is used. May the Lord judge between you and me. Let me give those to you. The first occurs in Genesis 16.5. 
It is Sarai telling Abram, I put my slave Hagar in your arms, and now she despises me. The Lord judge between you and me. So what happens after that? Sarai goes and mistreats Hagar, and she flees the camp. She's going to go home. She makes her way toward Egypt. But in order to get to Egypt, she has to go to one particular place for her survival to get there. That oasis, that uh, well, and described by the road to Shur, wherever that is. And that's where she went. And guess who was waiting for her there? We're told it's the angel of the Lord. Now, I just finished reading a book about that thick that really took a different view about these appearances of the Lord, the angel of the Lord in the Old Testament. But Dr. Johnson has had a great influence on me, and he took them as the Lord Jesus appearing in the Old Testament And here's the purpose. And you see it right here in this context. He appears because He's moving His plan forward. With both the saved and the wicked. He is moving His plan forward. So I I take the angel of the Lord to be the Lord Jesus Himself. Moving history forward. So He arrests her at this oasis. So he's waiting. He knew she'd have to be there, fill her water bags. And he begins to tell her who she is, where she's come from, where she's going. Isn't that amazing? He knows everything. He also tells her that she's pregnant with a boy. And he gives her the name to assign to that boy. Then he tells her, a bit about his character. He's a wild man. He's a donkey. And then he says something unbelievable. He will have many descendants. Now you go home, back to the tent where you came from, and you submit to Sarai. Now, let's think, let's go to this scene Sarai over here. Uh, from the day that that morning when she found out that Hagar had run and was no longer in the camp, it was a magnificent day for her. She was so happy. Please, what a burden. This is all gone. Never again. Uh, I think of that line of John La Carre's, uh, the opening line in the Russia house. He says, it was a bright, sunny Moscow day, all alpine, a day sins are forgiven. And I think, that's Sarai. You know, boy, I'm just so glad that's over. When suddenly, and can you hear the women in the camp beginning to yell out? And then others and others, here comes Hagar. And she is on a beeline to speak to Abram. And she tells him about this stranger. She calls him Bear Lahoy Roy, the one who sees me. He knew everything about me. And he said to name my son Ishmael. And then she says this. And he will have many, many descendants. Now, here's Abram. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. You saw him? You saw him? I've never seen him. I've heard him. I've never seen him. You actually saw him? And and his pronouncement of many, many generations of children. Those are my promises. 
Those belong to me. And He was giving them to you? And you see what happened in an instant? Hagar, this Egyptian slave, she goes right up the totem pole in the camp of Abram. What, sir, I say? The Lord judged between you and me. And He did. Can you think of anything more humiliating for her? Now, she's there. And she's honored. Here's the other place it's used. 1 Samuel 24.12 David could kill Saul. He had him dead to rights in the cave. But he spares him. He lets him go. He lets him go so that he will be his enemy next week and next month and pursue him and continue to hunt him down. He lets him go. And David pronounces these words, the Lord judge between you and me. And he does. And how long after this that Saul is on Mount Gilboa and the Philistines are coming down and pressing in upon the army. There go his sons. Death, death, death. And finally, here's Saul. Now in a panic, he commits suicide. And the Philistines go. And they called him God's king. What a joke. Commits suicide. In David's words, the Lord judged between you and me. What happened to David? Here's about, here's about the death of Saul. He goes to Hebron and he waits upon the Lord. He doesn't crown himself. 2 Samuel 5. All Israel assembled together and made David king. The game came to David. David didn't open his own doors. And that's the proverb. Look, he judges. I'd be afraid of what the Lord God would do to me if I took advantage of you, lied to you, stole from you. The Lord judge between me and you? He will. He will, and it's emphatic in His Word. Here's 19. An offended brother is like a strong city. So, you might have the, these words bars or barred. It's the word bolt. Now, what is a bolt? A bolt is that big, thick piece of timber that crosses the gate on the inside of the city. That's the bolt. It's what holds the gate together. Now, Here's what makes this proverb so difficult. Look, you have two similes here, which is the word like, comparisons. Two times. A strong city, barred gates, in comparison to an offended brother. What is that all about? That's what makes it so difficult. Plus, there's this word here we'll look at in a moment. So... Here is the wise procedure for determining the accuracy of facts and testimony. Basically, cross-examination. We looked at that, and now we're settling disputes. If we can, we tried with a lot, but this one is the real difficulty. The offended brother is the party involved in the conflict. This word offended, this is the... Another thing that makes this so difficult, very rare word used of, uh, of suffering loss to suffer a breach in friendship. There is a unique pain of disappointment brought about by a betrayal of friendship and thus the offended party. For David, it was his trusted advisor, confidant Ahithophel. He was the one who betrayed David. He was the brain power behind Absalom's rebellion. That's 2 Samuel 15 and 16. Here's the way David wrote about it. You don't think this wasn't painful? 
Psalm 41, verse 9, he writes, My close friend, whom I trusted, who ate my bread, has lifted up his heel against me. This phrase, my close friend, literally a man of peace. The idea, he was considered by David to be someone who would be committed to peace and welfare for not only his kingship, but for the laws of the land, the good of Jerusalem and Israel. A person who truly cared. This word trusted, batak, very famous Old Testament word, whom the king felt safe and secure with. He could lean upon. This man supported him. That's trust. The text says in Psalm 41, the eater of my bread, eating together the picture of communion, fellowship, intimacy. Now, let me say, we're just in the introduction here, but let me just say, just for a moment, that I want to speak to the young men that are here in this class today. Uh, some young men do come in here and sit at the back normally, slide in. And uh, I want to say, I've walked a mile in your shoes. I know exactly where you are. Growing your families, it's no secret how expensive children are in life. And it's no doubt how difficult it is to earn a living. Sometimes like licking through limestone. That's the market out there. I think of Jacob's words to Laban. Genesis 31:40 the drought consumed me the cold by night the sleep departed from and sleep departed from my eyes a particularly important verse for men that work that go out there and labor in the marketplace that are familiar with the daily hardships that no one accounts for and they don't account for them because by and large we're bottom line people i don't care what your problems are I want results. No excuses. And Jacob doesn't give them. And that speaks to his character. There's a certain maturity, I think, with that. Now, here is what I want you to know regarding Ahithophel. Because I used him as an illustration. And I think this is instructive. He was never wrong ever. Ever. Ahithophel. He was a precise, acute thinker. God gave him his prodigious mental capacities. It's called a gift. And here was his gift. He knew if you did this, that the reaction would be here, and here's how you counter it. Why, if he were alive today, there wouldn't be bank vaults big enough for his gold. This man is so valuable as a, a thinker. It's like looking at the future by listening to him. No record of his mistakes. Always saw in advance certain outcomes. And he was the brains behind Absalom's rebellion. What, what was that all about? Well, uh, Absalom chases David out of Jerusalem. He consolidates political power with the military, chases David out. And, uh, and now here's the picture. you got this punk kid with lots of hair sitting on a big throne. Now what are you going to do? Now what are you going to do? You see, David sent wise counsel to conflict against Ahithophel. What are you going to do, big boy? Well, uh, Absalom, he looked him immediately to Ahithophel. Ahithophel says, get up! Get up! Don't unsaddle your horses. Go get him. You've got him on the run. Go get him. Go get him now. Here was the other counsel. Oh, wait a minute. 
man, you just took down a big acquisition here. You need to consolidate. Give everybody a little rest. Fortify yourself politically. And then you go get him. You see, Ahithophel knew you don't let Joab get out into that forest. Then it becomes guerrilla warfare and you'll be a dead man. That's exactly what happened. Now, I said to you young men, I know exactly where you are. But the reality is God knows exactly where you are. Your bills, your tomorrows. And here's what I want you to know. You are going to face the Ahithophels in life. They're going to be out there. They're going to be out there in your professional life. They're going to be out there in your personal life. They're going to be in the church. I've been attacked both ways. And here's what you learn. You just trust the Lord and He gets you through. He's the one that provides. He always will. Trust Him and you'll learn what a magnificent future He has for you. Not because you're bright. Ahithophel was bright. It's because you're living for His glory. So here's the simple proposition for you. Invest in the Word of God. Invest in Believer's Chapel. Invest in prayer. Invest in service one to another. Because the Bible says, here's your logic. God's no man's debtor. He's not going to owe you anything. He's going to so bless you for your service and your goodness and your energy and your dedication and your focus. He's not your debtor. No, Proverbs 2.7, He gives victory in store for the upright. Those are the victories with your name on it in a lockbox, all locked up just for you to show you. You see? You see? Your faithfulness I'm going to give back to you a hundredfold in spades over and over in your life. Those are the victories. Now let me address this proverb. That was your introduction. In the top line, look at the proverb. We have the first like, the comparison. The offended brother is compared to the strong city. Strong city, let's think of strong cities. Okay, Jericho, that's a strong city. It was conquered. Uh, how about Jerusalem? Held by the Jebusites. Remember, they mocked David and they mocked Israel. But they got conquered. How about Babylon? No one can break the walls of Babylon, but it got conquered. Yeah. So it can be done, but the proverb is informing us of the enormity of the task. This is a proverb of simple reality. Here's the second comparison. Like, conflicts. The timber bolt at the gate. What's the gate? Well, if you look at it from a strategic position, the gate is the weakest point in the city wall. That's why you need the bolt. But it's still the weakest point. So the powerful here of the conflict would be hostile forces, they ply their tack to the weakest point. So what is the weakest point? This interpretation is difficult because the two comparisons really don't give us very much. But here is what I think the proverb is saying. Here's what many conservatives have kind of amalgamated into my mind that makes sense and I'm comfortable with it. Let's begin with this simple proposition. Romans 12, 18. The Apostle Paul says, as it depends on you, be at peace with all men. See, it's not an issue of forgiveness. In your mind, it is simply, this is reality. 
you have offended people in life. And that's the illustration of the attack of the city. Death, destruction, unreconciled people. They inflict great damage on one to another. Oh, you see this so often in marriages and divorces. Everybody knows where everybody's weak point is. Okay, so the proverb is telling us reestablishment is hard. Maybe in this lifetime it's impossible. It's, this is just a reality. We bump up, we scrape against one another. And the wise simply know that this is a reality. So here's your exhortation. Be careful. Be careful with people. Be careful with one another. Be careful how you talk. Be careful how you act. Proverbs 16.37 He who is slow to anger is better than the mighty. He who rules his spirit better than one who captures a city. And that's what the proverb is. Capturing the city. Attacking it at its weakest point. Let me close by saying I had a conversation with Dan just a couple of weeks ago. And uh, he and I were both in agreement. Uh, here's this national Christian leader speaking out, and he's lost a hearing with me. I'm an offended brother. How dare you take that position? And Dan agreed. We just don't pay attention to him anymore. That's losing a hearing. And I've lost hearings in my Christian life. I want to be an influence. I want to be an influence of good. But I have, I have offended people. And uh, that's to my fault. And I'm, in reality, probably never going to win them back. And that's to my shame and detriment. But there's two sides to every story. Here's the other side. People have offended me. Now, it has nothing to do with forgiveness. It just simply means they don't get a hearing with me. And I think that was the context of my conversation with Dan. I'm done with them. That's just ridiculous that you would take that position. So, it's a difficult proverb. Wives, ask your husbands. And if anyone is still confused, ask the elders. It's been a blessing to be with you this year. Let's close in a word of prayer. Father, thank You for the teaching ministry of the Word. Thank You for Believer's Chapel, for the elders, the deacons, their service. Thank You, Lord, for the young men uh, in this church. I pray for them. Uh, bless them mightily. They are the heritage of this place. Guide, guard, direct them. Give them great focus, dedication to the things that belong to You. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.